After losing her family to darkness, Kirsty Cotton has been committed to a psychiatric hospital under the watchful eye of Dr. Chenard. What she doesn't know is Dr. Chenard is an occult obsessive who has obtained the demonic puzzle box known as the Lament Configuration. All hell is about to break loose once again in the 1988 sequel Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. I'm Connor Izagari. I'm Caleb Jay. I'm Colton Jenkins. And this is Filmgasm. <laughs> Happy Wednesday and welcome to the Filmgasm podcast. This week, in honor of the long-awaited release of the Hellraiser reboot, we're going back to the demented mind of Clive Barker and discussing the first sequel to Hellraiser, which we covered way back in August of 2020 on episode 97. So we haven't been in Hellraiser in quite a while. Uh, That was me and Austin, and we were uh, were a little taken aback. It had been, I think it was his like second time with Hellraiser, I think it was my second time as well. We were just like, what the... Fuck, this is a hard movie to catalog. And this sequel, I would say, is even harder. Yeah, this uh, this takes everything the first one is and just, like, ups it mm. way more. Um, but also uh, giving you an idea of, like, this portion of hell that the Cenobites and uh, them live in. Or whatever you want to call it, uh, which I think what I've liked about so much is that it really dwells more into like their reward, what the Sunbites are, their reward looks like, and what they do, or kind of giving you this. I it's taken me a while because I've only seen this a couple of times, but this time I actually kind of liked the villain they introduced along with bringing you know Julia back. So I, I just like a lot of what they do with it and how they kind of expand on what they started with the first movie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, Colton, you said this was this was pretty. Uh new to you the hellraiser movies uh this was your first time uh first thoughts yeah so i i never seen hellraiser before this i i know the character and i've always kind of liked the aesthetic of like you know satanic shit but i don't don't know The, uh, the first movie was i thought was pretty goofy but still fun to watch the second one i liked more but i still thought it was pretty goofy and at the end, I kind of just found myself thinking, like, "Oh, is this a weird sex thing, or is this just, you know, <laughs> torture porn? What's going on?" <laughs> I love that you found it goofy. Like this movie has spawned some serious nightmares, and and you're just like, "Yeah, <laughs> like, that's funny." So I saw when I saw this for the first time, I was like eleven or twelve, and I, I froze up. Like this, this freaked me out. Uh, oh. so that's that's interesting. I don't think I ever got freaked out by Hellraiser somehow. I was always fascinated by it. So, I I respect Colton's stance. Do you think it's funny that you think the first Star Goofy? Because I'm like, dude, you got to watch some of the sequels and the shit they pull. Again, when you get into those years where you're like, hey, we got this script. Cool, just put Pinhead in it somehow and we'll fucking, we'll, work, we'll, we'll just get to it. Yeah. It, uh, like, I really like, uh, like the effects in the first one, when Frank is being like resurrected, I thought that was really cool, pretty well done. Um, the second one, uh, the second one, I I kind of, especially when the doctor was introduced, like when he became a Cenobite and he had like the finger tentacles shit coming out. I was like, oh, okay, so this is like hentai. Understood. I I know what I'm watching here. I get it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, this is, you know, it's not a very thin veil with Hellraiser. Like, it's very clear what they're trying to say here. Uh, you're either in or you're out. Like, this, this is either your nightclub or not. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Uh, before we get further into it, uh, we've got a handful of updates on the Rewind. First up, an update on last week's episode on Hocus Pocus. Apart from the release of the sequel on Disney Plus, which is pretty good, I thought. Check that out. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, apparently, you can book an Airbnb in the Sanderson Sisters Cottage in Danvers, Massachusetts, which is about 13 minutes outside of Salem. The whole experience cost about 31 bucks a night, includes a stay what? in an exact replica of the film's cottage and a special screening of Hocus Pocus 2. 
Uh, guests can start applying to visit on Wednesday, October 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is very limited. Like this is like they're only picking a couple, a few people, but you can go stay at the Sanderson Sisters Cottage for a and, couple nights. And after Hurricane Ian, smart. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I found this before the hurricane. I don't know if this is still standing, so maybe. <laughs> it probably is. I don't think Massachusetts got hit that hard, even with the remnants. Um, that'd be, yeah, that'd be fucking awesome. Like I said, like, um, I know there's some, uh, I've seen some online discourse about how people feel about um, Hocus Pocus 2. Um, surprisingly, I've seen more discourse on that than I've seen on the Monsters, weirdly enough, um, since it got, came out. Um but like I said, I'm with you. I re- I really enjoyed it. So I I'd, I'd be down to so like stay in the stay in the the Sanderson sisters' home for a little bit and get like a special screening of the sequel. Yeah, okay, I'd do it. I did see that. I I think it is couples only. I guess they don't want you know weirdo single dudes. Just like I want to I want to stay I'll, in the cottage. I'll I'll act like I'm gay. It's fine. <laughs> I am no shame. Okay, Who, who's gonna be your who, who's your partner? I'll Caleb, I'll do anything. Mm-hmm. I'll do anything. <laughs> Look at that! Oh, you got a volunteer. That's what I'm talking about. Oh my god! <laughs> That's what you call a team a team player. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you I hope you all enjoy your couples weekend. Uh, <laughs> get a I'll get a nice blonde come over wig. I wear a button up shirt. I wear thick rimmed. You know, big glasses. I'll bring a couple of Budweisers over. You know, I'll take a couple pictures. I wear like a, a wife beater. I like that. Pants. I'm really trash it up. I think Colton, you should do exactly your costume you just said, and then Caleb, you should dress as Pinhead, <laughs> <laughs> and then just never address it. What would happen if Jeffrey Dahmer opened the box? He right. Some I people. Know. Hell and heaven are, you know, go hand in hand for some people. I I don't want to know as someone who is um, currently watching the Dahmer show on Netflix. I I don't want to know because dear God, I, even I'm like watching that show, forgetting some of the elements of the case, and I'm like, yeah, nope, I don't want to know what's in that fucking thing for Dahmer because what I'm seeing is, oh God, it's so good, it's so good, and I keep getting invested in the story, and then I remember that this shit legitimately happened, and I'm like, oh. I shouldn't be as invested as I am. Yeah. Well, what I like is the show doesn't even really take like this sympathetic stance. Like it's not trying to be like, oh, "Oh, look at poor Jeffrey. Yeah. It's just saying, this is the facts. This is what happened. Enjoy the show. Yeah. Yet you get so invested because he did such a damn good job. You're like, oh, you're like, wait a minute. No, he is a monster. He is so good at playing him, though. It's scary. I decided, I decided not to watch it when I found out that, um, some of the victims weren't asked about their involvement. They just went with it and found out about like their stories being involved in this when they watched, like when they found out. Oh, what? So that's when I was like, I don't want to see this. Oh, dang. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's when it's when, when you're dramatizing real life murder and you lose sight of like the victims, you know what they want. I'm out. So you know, I, you guys, you do whatever you want, but I'm not, I'm not watching this. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh god, now I feel bad. I, I, I kind of feel bad at the same time. Like, do they did they get consulted for every podcast and show then that comes out talking about Dahmer? Mm. I'm just saying, like, I'm not trying to be like an asshole, but I'm saying, like, they're pointing this show out, but are they consulted for every single thing imaginable? They should be Dahmer. I feel like they should be. I mean, so that guy ruined just, their lives. I know, but I'm just saying, like, that's like for me. It's like, okay, if let's say they didn't, you know, like last podcast I left, or um, you know, times like if he didn't consult the victims, then am, am I going to draw a line there too? You know what I mean? Well, that's di- see. I think when it's like a you know a documentary style or a retelling style, then it's not you know like this is painted as like a a dramatization. Yeah, like, this is an actor playing Dahmer. Like this is a you know movie of the week kind of thing so that that's a, a much different situation right but even then in the documentaries they have reenactments where they get actors to act out the part you can keep watching this really if you want. i'm not saying you can i'm <laughs> just saying like they have actors sometimes re- doing the reenactments 
Hold on, let me go make some popcorn real quick. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I would get it if this show was going out of its way to be like, we should sympathize with Jeffrey, but the show is not doing that. It's painting him as like, this guy's a monster. This is just the facts gathered from years of profiling that we have on him. Okay. That's, I'm just saying, my, like, this is what I heard, and this is my personal preference to just not bother with it. That's that's what I'm doing. You guys do whatever you want. I don't care. Just wow. Separate art from artists. <laughs> this isn't art. This is <laughs> this is exploitation. That's not the same. <laughs> it's totally the same thing. Anyway, all right. Next update. This is an update on three past episodes: 1978 Halloween, 1981's Halloween Two, and 2018's Halloween. We got the full trailer for Halloween Ends which hits theaters next week on Friday, October 14th. And I think this looks quite nice. I'm excited to see this. Yeah, I'm glad they aren't like doing trailer overload like they did for the past two installments. Um, so getting one literally like a week before the movie comes out and they're like, okay, this is the official trailer. I'm like, okay, cool. And it does paint a much better picture of what, what the story is doing. Because I was like reading the log line like, okay, they're really trying to put us on a red herring that like this this guy's you know katie's babysitting is killed while he's on watch like come on we we know it's called halloween ends but um the yeah the trailer put a lot more like better focus on what the story's gonna be it looks um, fucking entertaining as hell i already got, actually already got my ticket for next week so i'm excited nice very nice i feel weird uh for movies like this especially like um, because I'm, you know, recently when I became friends with you with you guys, I'm just now getting into, I guess, horror movie classics. Like, uh, I didn't grow up with Halloween. Like, I've seen I've seen most of them at this point, but I didn't grow up with it. So I guess, like, for people who did grow up with it, it's cool to see, like, oh, they're gonna have their big showdown now in this in this last movie. But me, just fucking shoot the guy. I don't understand why it's been stretched this fucking long. Just shoot him. They have, they have shot the guy. Yeah, many times. He keeps getting up. Yeah. You gotta watch the ending to Halloween dude, right? 4, is dude. Is he just a guy? Uh, well, I, don't 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 ask that. <laughs> in this in this canon, maybe. <laughs> maybe. He yeah. starts out just a guy again, but the Halloween kills quickly establish that it might just he might be more than just a man. Yeah. But you know, we'll see. I'm I, I'm sure that we're going to get every answer we've ever wanted in mm-hmm. Halloween ends. I'm sure we're gonna find out what he looks like, what he sounds like, where he's from. The, sure all that's gonna happen. Oh, they're not gonna have him talk. Not after Rob Zombie pulled that show with his Halloween too. Well, it's sarcasm, Kate. I'm just saying. <laughs> of course he's not gonna talk. We're not gonna get shit. I know that. I'm I'm just excited <laughs> to see him, you know. The this is this is definitely Jamie Lee's last Halloween. That's that's about as true as the ends comes in the title. Is that this is ending for Jamie Lee? Yeah, I was just about to say. I was like, like, oh yeah, this is definitely the last Halloween for sure. It's it's gonna end on a fucking cliffhanger or something. It's her last Halloween. I'm sure about that. There's no like, we're definitely gonna see Michael again. This is a million dollar franchise. That's not it. But I do think Laurie's last story is this movie. Oh, absolutely. Which will be. It was funny when I went to go see Smile, they played the trailer, right? And just by like a, a, a spiteful God, I got like sat. I somehow in the seat I pick ahead of time on my phone, somehow a group of teenagers, loud, obnoxious ones that won't shut up, sat next to me. So it's not the fact that they're teen. I don't give a shit. I understand. We were all young ones. We all did shit to entertain ourselves. It's just the fact that, you know, obviously, you know, they don't. And we were all like that when we were teenagers. We don't think outside of our fucking selves. So they're being loud. And one of them very loudly as they're playing the Halloween church goes, man, they're really stretching it. This thing thin. And I'm thinking, are you saying that because this franchise has been going on since 1978? Or are you saying that because it's the third film in a franchise that you only know of since 2018? Or I was like, because if that's the case, you should really go back and see how long they have stretched this sucker out. <laughs> <laughs> that's inter- you keep getting that you keep getting people who make random weird snide comments to your trailers it's like the fourth yeah. story you've told me of that happening to you and always the halloween trailers it is always the halloween trailers that's weird <laughs> I'm like, is there, 
Can I not enjoy the Halloween trailer? Am I just not given that opportunity? And also, regardless of how old you are, if you talk at the movies, fuck you a million times. Yes. Yeah. I will say when I when I went to go see Barbarian, I was in the film completely alone. There was literally nobody else in the theater with me because it was like one o'clock on like a Tuesday or something. Um, and when I got scared, I had to pull out my phone because I was like, I can I can fucking I was texting you. In the movie, I was like, I don't want to fucking look at the screen right now. I'm too fucking scared. <laughs> I was like, I'm not looking. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was it was fun for the the jump scares and smile because man, one the I one the the females in that group, I guess she screams a lot. She was like the easily scared one, and oh man, so many times turn smile. It's just like the loudest scream, which did provide a nice relieving laugh. You know, I fucking get into the mood because I mean, like, there were some good scares. Get into it, have my moment, and laugh because you know she's just she's not taking these scares well. <laughs> I look forward to seeing this. I I had a feeling this was going to be a winner, and apparently it is. Yeah, it's actually really good. I was going to write it off, and I can say I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last update. This updates our way back episode on Blade. The upcoming Blade reboot has lost its director. Bassam Tariq, just two months before production was scheduled to start, has has backed away. Uh, he's staying on as executive producer while Kevin Feige scrambles to find a replacement. I don't think that'll be hard. Uh, word on the street is the shortlist includes Sam Raimi, who just gave oh, a, girl, fuck, yeah. a near billion dollar hit with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So that would be, you know, kind of a safe bet. I just read he has another horror film, though he's getting ready to shoot. Apparently, he is back on it. Well, that's great. I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I hope this doesn't derail Blade too hard because I was really like, this is, I'm looking forward to this big time. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, you know, the, the news with Deadpool 3 has overtaken everything for me, but I'm really looking forward to Blade also. Yeah. Mm, I hope it works out. I think I, what happened? Like, he, that guy had like, no real credits apart from like a couple short films. This was they're, huge for him. They're claiming he had something else to go film because I kept, I guess he kept moving the production of Blade. Like there was a lot of production movement on it. And I'm like, I get that, but like you got a guaranteed job in two months. Actually, currently, because I'm sure you're getting paid during the pre production process. Um, yeah, and also, you know, a guarantee that millions of people are going to see your movie. Yeah, because yeah, people want to see Blade on the big screen again. Yeah, that was a... He picked the wrong door. <laughs> if that's the case, he picked the wrong door. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm stepping away from a, from a Marvel movie. I don't really want to be... He I don't, I don't... could have easily won the car. <laughs> Instead, he's going home with the dinette set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unreal. Well... Feige, I'm sure we'll have no problem replacing him. You know, that's what he did with Ant Man. Yeah, and, uh, that worked I'm, out. Yeah, I'm sure there will probably be another pro- production shift. So I wouldn't hold my breath on the release date currently holding. Um, if they don't find someone soon that can, you know, be on board to shoot, but hopefully he can find someone quick enough to change. But I'm no longer holding my breath for the release date that they have in place for it. Yeah, probably. Well. Yeah, I think Ramy would have been a good choice, but if he's doing his own thing too, who he actually has the clout and respect to do his own thing, I respect yeah. that. <laughs> but I'll say it, and it dep- I mean, he could easily say yes to this and then put the other thing on hold, and it, it's weird. Um, but yeah, know, despite like all the you know a lot of fans being like, "Oh, Multiverse of Madness was trash," still made almost a billion dollars worldwide. Yeah, so, and honestly, it's, I liked it. I actually I still seen as yeah, I liked it. I thought it was one of the better Phase Four films. I think it got overhyped because of No Way Home, and Marvel kind of overhyped it themselves. But I quite enjoyed what I got. Yeah, same. Is is Raimi involved at all in the new Evil Dead? Yeah, he's producer. Okay. Yeah. Him, Bruce Campbell, and Robert Taper will continue to produce Evil Dead films until the day they die. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I have faith in it. I'm I'm on board because you know if Raimi wasn't, then I'd be worried. But no, he's spearheading this. Oh no, he's spearheading it, and the fact that of all the things burning to the ground over at DC, uh, the fact that that was like, hey, we can move this to theaters. I was like, oh, okay, they have faith in this one. Warner Brothers, not just DC, as we've learned. Our yeah. Warner Brothers, yeah, everything happening at Warner Brothers, which 
in case anyone, I know there was a rumor going on that they might get sold to Discovery. Apparently, Zaslov, the, the dictator the man is, <laughs> had a meeting to just very much put out that we are not selling WB. He is not letting go of WB anytime soon. Baron of bad decisions. Can't wait to see what yeah. he does next. Oh, dude, it's it's wonderful. It's he not, is it's it's not yeah. <laughs> I said that sarcastically. Yeah, sarcasm, Connor. All right. Oh, uh-huh. touche. Oh, uh-huh. touche. <laughs> yes. They were moving forward. Found us nation six, whatever the fuck they call it, though. Did you hear about the pitch meeting for that? No. So, but maybe. so they did these, the directors that they picked did a Zoom call, right? And they staged a fake fucking like Rue Goldberg excuse death to themselves during the pitch meeting. And once everyone realized what happened, they were like, yeah, you're getting it. Like, you guys have the job. That is some risky shit. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I still got to see those. <laughs> yeah. I just, I'm good to know that the directors that they selected are apparently absolutely dying to do that movie. Well, good. I like when somebody who cares about the product wants to make good products. You don't see that a lot in Hollywood anymore. No, <laughs> actually at WB. <laughs> um, okay, that's all for the rewind. Uh, now, before we get started, I've got a question for y'all, as is tradition. Now, things to be on the bed. <laughs> on pri- <laughs> so yeah, on Prime Video, the description for Hellbound reads. Hellbound Hellraiser 2 is the shocking follow-up to the film that redefined the face of horror. Two decades later, it remains the most brutally original sequel in horror film history. A bit presumptuous, I thought. What? But it got me thinking. Like, like, really the most original horror sequel of all time? I mean, who are you trying to, like, what are you trying to sell here, Prime? Like, you already have the movie. I don't know. Just seemed weird. So... It got me thinking, what do you guys think are the elements of a great horror sequel? Sorry, I was reading my arrow copy of it to see if it said remotely the same thing. They downplay it and just say, you know, one of the most celebrated horror sequels of all time, which is like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I know a lot of people that really like this movie. Um, uh, But to answer your question, sorry. Um, I think my big thing, and I kind of touched on it when I was talking about Hellbound, is I think the biggest thing is building off what you've established. I think if you can find a solid way to build and continue the story in any kind of way and give people the fans more of what they want while finding improving on elements that didn't work in the original or, you know, keeping the elements that worked and, you know, maintaining them, things like that. That's how, to me, you end up not just with a great sequel, but a lot of times how you end up with franchises like Friday the 13th or Saw or Tease, you know, like, you get these franchises because they get that that sequel that just improved so much more for people, and then it just kept going. Yeah, good points, Colton. What do you think? Um, I kind of agree. I don't like when people think that sequels always have to be like, oh, like bigger and better than the last one. You can keep it just as simple as long as you. I think you need to uh, look at the critiques people had on the first film. And fix those mistakes without, well, not necessarily mistakes, just, you know, yeah, fix those mistakes without changing the story, continuing the story and building off of what you've already established. That's why, like, um, not only, like Evil Dead 2, I think, is my one of my favorite horror movies of all time. And it's a sequel just because it's so fucking wacky and they build off of what they establish in Evil Dead 2 while also kind of going a little little off the rails but you know it still meshes really well with the story yeah yeah that, that's a good that's a good example i think you know when it comes to making a good horror sequel i always like more mythology like building on the pre-existing world we've established but also maintaining a similar vibe and a, and a tone like i want to feel like i'm watching part of the same story and yeah. I think the best, like, Saw for me is the best example of that. Like, the Saw franchise always feels very connected. Like, you're just watching an ongoing story here from the first one all the way to Spiral. It all feels like the same universe and the same story. And that's important. I, I, I You need that. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's hard making a good sequel, but I think it's even harder making a good horror sequel. Yeah, I think. Stuff... Oh, sorry, uh, well, what about no. stuff like that's like a series, like you said, Saw, like not even just Harry, not even just horror, but like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, like all those big series. Like, I I don't know, I don't really. This is weird, but I don't. Qu- I don't qualify those as sequels, really, because it's it's a series. It doesn't. I don't really. I don't know how to explain. It. I also, got to remember Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings are based off pre-existing material, so they have that yeah. to fall back on. Um, I was gonna say a point you brought up with like keeping it or keeping the tone uh, of the original. I would say just keeping the heart, because we've seen in some cases where changing the tone drastically does work. Um, you know, Cole, you brought up obviously the Evil Dead, hardcore you know very much like horror movie i know some people probably find it corny now but what it was going for at the time it came out was hardcore horror was even that too said let's up this let's up the humor some more let's you know Raimi's like i want to put some of the humor i like into the movie more and so it's a much more of a horror comedy um another example obviously we did it a while ago on filmgasm but you have texas chainsaw massacre which is just it's it's grimy it's dirty it's you know, it feels like you are just there watching this happen. Like you're there, not just on your couch, but you're there watching it. The sequel, over the top, just goofy, wild, and somehow it all works. Um, for me personally, I know Colton, you had quite a visceral reaction. Um, but the Strangers, one, I think again, the first one was just like it's very much like a '70s type of like thriller type film. You know, home invasion, very serious, very somber, nihilistic. And the sequel says, let's change that up a bit. Keeps the keeps them in it, but it goes for this like 80s, like neon soak. Just let's just have a fun time in this trailer park and go for it a little bit more. Which is why I think I liked the sequel. They just said, let's just not do the same thing. Let's make it different. The only reason I didn't I didn't like the sequel to the strangers was because the protagonists are so fucking stupid. I know it's like a trope in horror movies, like. I was like, you have got to apply that to at least like a hundred horror films. So just I, attack the strangers, pray at night for Christ's sakes. <laughs> also, the protagonists are children. That's fair, but like the dad was like, give me your phones. And then like when shit starts getting real, they're like, can we have our phones? He's like, no. Like what? Look around you, man. You had to maintain control. I guess so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> Caleb's like an elephant. He never fucking forgets. <laughs> he ever. said that. And I was like, whoa, I said that a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, not a bad sequel, but this is weird. But 22 Jump Street, I thought it was an interesting sequel because they literally said multiple times that it's the same thing as the first one. And that yeah. was like the big gimmick of the movie was well, that. that- Thing. That continued on to the tone of, and you know vibe and heart of the first one, which was mocking the idea that it was some you know a reboot of an old TV show. That was the gag yeah. for that movie, so yeah. it, it made sense that they would go to that trope and just mock that for the sequel. Yeah, yeah. I think the hardest genre to sequelize is comedy, like by far, it is so yes. hard to, do, to pe- capture that magic twice. Very few good or uh, comedy comedy sequels. The drop from like Hangover One to Hangover Two. It's fucking huge because the second one is awful. Yeah, yeah, and then three is a dumpster fire. Yeah. Three is barely a comedy, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, people always say like it's so hard to make a horse good horse, and I'm like, I have like at least ten franchises that definitely say you can make a good horse sequel. Um, I I do think comedy leads it in being the hardest one. I would say horror is right behind it. Um, but I think comedy now at the same time, I do think sometimes people are kind of unfair to some shit. Like, um, what people are like, Anchorman 2 is not as funny as first. Well, no shit, Anchorman 2 is not gonna be as funny as the first one, but I th- I thought it was still funny. I thought it still had a lot of the, the same humor, and I was still laughing at a lot of the jokes. Um, so I think sometimes people just go on wanting to hate. Um, what kind of I know it's not, it's you know, a little bit because it's recent and it's a little bit everything with you know, comedy and horror and obviously being a family film but hocus pocus too you know there's a corner of the internet that just is shitting <laughs> relentlessly on it and i'm like it retains the spirit of the original i thought it was pretty good like it could have been so much worse than what we got yeah i think it comes down to either continue the story or revise critiques and build on 
story or pre-existing characters. Mm-hmm. That's it. I think we can all agree action is the easiest to sequelize. Yes. Just yes. give me more action scenes. That's all. Yeah. You literally, that's the one genre where it's like, look, we're going to give you less story and more action sequence. So I'm like, sounds great. Yeah, They don't Do have that. to try anything. You just like put it in a different country. You give us a vaguely Eastern European or like Hispanic bad guy. And you, you know, you put the main character's family in danger again. No, no, I'm in. Taken. Okay. <laughs> Do you, you know what's. Do you qualify like Marvel movies as sequels, even if they're not in the same, like, if it's not following the same character? That all falls into action for me. I was about to say, what do you consider that? Because, like, they have, like, you know, standalone trilogies and then the big team ups. Yeah, that one's a little bit different. Um, I was going to say this, uh, Colin kind of actually reminded me when you said, like, taking into the criticisms of, like, maybe your prior film, um, just because it's coming out here soon, actually, for the Halloween season, Terrifier 2. Um, the director and writer for that, he said one of the reasons it took him so long was because he actually went and looked at the reviews for his first film. And he said he looked at those and actually took those in account to make a better sequel. He said like he took into account all the people complaining about the fact that his first movie had no real story or no protagonist to follow that, you know, some people thought it was very, mis- you know, misogynistic um, in the film. And he he actually read all those and said, you know what? Let me improve those in the sequel while also giving people more of what they already liked in the first one. And so far, I haven't seen it, but the reviews for the sequel are better uh, than they are for the first one. So apparently, it worked for him because people who didn't really like the first one were like, oh, hey, we like this one more because the story is better, characters are better, you still get the awesome kills. And then people like myself, you didn't give a shit because we had awesome glory car- kills. Or like, holy shit, we get all of, we get the awesome boy kills and a story and characters to care about. Oh my god! So it, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, I, you know, not a lot of studios go that route of listening <laughs> to uh, fans what they want, but apparently he decided to do it and it's working out in his favor quite well. Well, I'm glad about that. I got to see Terrifier. Um, <laughs> I. I like, you know, when it comes to just making a good sequel, I just, I look for the same elements, you know, when making just a good movie in general. And there's some sequels I love more than the, you know, their first films. And it's always just a delight to get more of something you love that's just as good as what you love the first time. And it's exceedingly rare, I think, these days. So, yeah. you know, when I get it, I'm a happy guy. Oh, dude, I always tell people that, like, as much as I love Friday 13th, like, as a franchise, I will take part two over part one any day because i do think part two is a lot more uh it's more fun it's just a better film than part one is and you know jason isn't even in the first one so you just won't let that go <laughs> he's on the he's on the poster art no it that's his mom silhouette. that's his mom yeah for the first one it's just somebody holding the knife that could be anybody that's yeah. fair but it, it has the body type type of jason no that I feel like that's you putting that into the picture. <laughs> I feel like that's you projecting, Colton. <laughs> <laughs> that that franchise has some good sequels, but it's got some shitty ones, you know. And mm. every horror, like, there's only one perfect horror franchise. We've talked about this, Caleb. It's Evil Dead. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We came up to that conclusion. Yeah, everything else has flaws, and that's just you know what you're gonna have to deal with if you're gonna watch movies. Nothing's perfect. Yeah. I mean, I think the only other franchise for me in horror that comes close to being Evil Dead and the consistency is it's a toss up between actually the Chucky franchise and Final Destination because those, even like the ones I don't like a lot, I, I can still watch. Like, see the Chucky's growing on me. Over the, nah, the weakest point of of the Child's Play series is Child's Play Three. Even that one's grown on me, and I don't really like it all that much, but it's grown on me. I still don't like it a lot. And even Don Mancini says, like, the reason he did Briar Turkey was because he was like, we were just doing the same thing by three, and I was already tired of it. I want to do something different. So we did Briar Turkey. Speaking of, I think Chucky season two is is this Wednesday. It's this week. Right on. Not wait. Cool. Well, that was a good that was a good discussion. I enjoyed that. Uh, So let's talk about the uh, bit of production of Hellraiser two. Hellbound was directed by Tony Randall or Randell, I don't really know how to say that, who had an uncredited role in editing the first film. So he and Clive Barker were comfortable with each other and uh, 
Barker returned as an executive producer with a story credit. Uh, Randell would later direct 1992's Amityville, 1992, It's About Time, the film that I think personally has the worst title in movie history. Have we not seen like half the Amityville horror titles? That one especially though, Amityville, 1992, It's About Time. Like, are you kidding me? How presumptuous. Like, like, I've been waiting for this shit. (laughs) Yeah. Is that like an official Amityville sequel? Is it one of the many unofficial sequels? It's It's an official. I think it's like Amityville 4 or 5. Okay. So it was like it, dude. The the box sets for those things are crazy. They have like a cursed box set for the cursed line of the film. It, I'm good with just owning the original because that one's mildly decent to me. Yeah, true. Oh, well, that was like he's he's had some other interesting credits, but this was the this was the one that jumped out. He also had a, a writing credit for Hellraiser three. Uh, when asked why he didn't return as director, Barker said, "Quote." For lots of reasons, the timing didn't work for me to direct the second one. They wanted a sequel, and they wanted it reasonably fast, and I was just too involved elsewhere. I've just delivered one novel, and I'm delivering another before the end of the year. I've also got a screenplay for my next picture, which is a fantasy adventure, which will hopefully get into pre-production before the end of the year. So I think he just had other shit going on. He didn't want to do, he wanted, you know, to be involved, but he didn't want to oversee production, which is, you know, I get that. Yeah, then he... Kind of like Cobner, kind of like, a, unfortunately, like not always a greatest relationship with studios, um, mainly because they put a lot of doubt in them. Like the the Ran, uh, Tony Rand was actually the one really backing them up on a lot of stuff in the first Hellraiser when the studio was like, "Well, do this instead, do this instead." And he kind of was the middleman, and be like, "Look, Clive, let's try this, and you know, hopefully this works. You like it, and it gets them off your back." Um, and then obviously, you know, the, the many different cuts of Nightbreed that we got which was an awesome movie i've seen it for the first time this year actually um you know that was studio interference and then it just got to the point by lord of illusions that clive said after that film came out clive Archer said fuck it i'm done and then he took a very long sabbatical um just now kind of coming back you know obviously he's, he's an executive producer on the new hellraiser he is working on something with Mick garris for uh tv so you know he's he's kind of, he's made his way back, but he he was fed up and took a long break. Yeah. Lord of Illusions is my dad's white whale. He he wants that Blu-ray so much. He's been trying to find that for so long. It's only on Screen Factory. I'm pretty sure they still have it. They're out of print. We looked. Oh shit, they're out of print. Yeah, we looked. Damn, I thought they saw. I know they had it for a long time. Yeah, by the time we we found, by the time we decided to look there, we couldn't find it. So that's like just, in, it's in the wind for him now. He's the biggest Clyde Barker fan I've ever known. He's read all of his books. He's a huge fan. So he's uh, he's looking forward to this new Hellraiser. Uh, the original story featured Kirsty's father, Larry, as a prominent character, but Andrew Robinson declined to return. He was unhappy with the script, felt there was nowhere else to go with the character. Uh, screenwriter Peter Atkins was relieved as now he felt the narrative would work better in his finished product. He was like, oh, now I don't have to shove the dad in here. <laughs> Which is interesting. He was like, oh, less work. Thank God. I mean, he sounds like me. Oh, you want me to write less now? Oh, whoo, whoo, I got you. Yeah. Andrew Robinson, I I really like that guy. He's got so, He's got a creepy look about him. Every time I see him in something, I'm like, "Oh, this guy's up to something." I, I like the, I like the switch he does in the first one because he plays like, generally like nice dad, and you're like, "Okay, I like this guy." And then when he gets to the point where you know it's supposed to be Frank essentially, and uh, he's like portraying his mannerisms and stuff, I'm like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. One of my favorite things about the first one is when he turns like Frank takes Larry's skin, and then Kirsty's like. Daddy, you're in trouble. And he's bleeding around all of like the his entire yeah. head, and she doesn't see it. She doesn't notice that like her dad is bleeding out and also staring at her in a creepy way. Hi, a trailer, man. She wasn't noticing anything. Yeah. Uh I remember I, I, I was really uh surprised when I found and I realized that Andrew Robinson is the bad guy in Dirty Harry. He's the Scorpio killer. <laughs> Oh, yeah <laughs> crazy that movie kicks ass i'd love to do dirty harry on this show that's just clint eastwood blasting 
away idiots and not giving a fuck. It's such a fun movie. Like most of his films. But in this case, but this case, he's got a fucking, you know, 44 Magnum giant ass handgun pointed right in their goddamn face. <laughs> and okay. how, do you, how do you not just love that? Well, so you literally just described like a humongous chunk of that man's filmography. <laughs> that's, that's true. But in this case, like Dirty Harry specifically, he's like, you know, try it. See what happens. Like, I'll have my badge at the end of the day, regardless of what you do. Honestly, the only thing that ever changed was he got older and then he added the mythos of like, I'm I'm done with this shit to it. But it would always end up just being him going, okay, I'll blast some heads off and no, don't give a shit. Colton, have you seen Dirty Harry? Um, I don't want to make anyone mad, but no. That's okay. This is I actually safe- haven't seen, I haven't seen any Clint Eastwood films. Okay, now I'm mad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would love the idea of Connor's like, it's okay. It's a safe space. As soon as you say that, he just loses. It's not a space. It's a table. <laughs> It's not a safe space. <laughs> I didn't like the strangers, and I'm crucified. <laughs> it's a safe space as long as you don't get on Caleb's bad side, then it's a safe space. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. The offshoot is you're never going to know if you have until it's too late. I'm, That's very, <laughs> I'm very sneaky like that. There you go. Dirty Harry is a fun movie, though. There's like five of them. They're all basically the same movie. It's he's Clint Eastwood is this hardened... I could give a shit cop in San Francisco who doesn't play by the rules and he's got a 44 Magnum and he's like, you know, you got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? You know, that just, it's, it's awesome. And the first one, he's basically going after the Zodiac killer. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Good movies. Uh, and Larry was the bad guy in that. Hence the connection. Uh, but he didn't come back for this one. So they had to double down on Frank and really just ambiance. <laughs> A lot of this is landscape shots of hell. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why they dubbed down on Frank. So you could just dub down on Julia, who I actually quite like as a villain. And I would have just had like Julia be the main villain. I do. I mean, granted, I do really like how she gets back at Frank. I'm like, oh, yeah. You, I was like, I know you're the bad person here, but fuck. Yeah, that was pretty cool. When she like kills him, she's like nothing personal, babe. I was like, oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I was more like, do you deserve a triumphant revenge? Like, after all the shit you did? <laughs> For that moment, yes. But then she's quickly the bad guy again. Can I can I rant about something way off topic for a second? Speaking of triumphant revenge. So, I was watching uh, this video of this person go through, like, uh, horror movies. And if they're your favorite, what it means, like... It was it was like uh, it's like what your favorite horror movie says about you, according to me. And she got to Midsummer, and she said the phrase, I know a lot of people like this movie because the boyfriend got what he fucking deserved. But and then she went off on a tangent and I was like, what the actual fuck are you talking about? So let me just say just for you know anyone who and anyone who's listening and you guys, um, the boyfriend did not get what he fucking deserved at all. The boyfriend was the victim of the whole fucking thing because he was just a dude who was in a relationship. She was a lot for him, which I mean, you know, that's understandable. You don't want to be in a relationship with someone like that anymore. That's fine. Break up with her. But then, like, he gets drugged. He gets forced to have sex with this lady and then he gets put in a bear suit and burnt alive. That's horrible. And anyone who watches Midsummer and is like, oh, yeah, the boyfriend deserves that. Those are the people that the movie was like meant to shine a light on. Like if you agree with what the cult's doing, you are the horror element of this movie. I support that 100 percent Sorry, I know that was a weird tangent, but you said revenge and I just I just got mad again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, I I support and also mainly because I just didn't really I thought the movie was okay anyway, so I support. It, it wasn't that good. <laughs> it wasn't my good either. Yeah, no. I enjoyed it way more when it was called The Wicker Man. So yeah, that's... I enjoyed the idea of it not being almost three hours long. Yeah, that too. It's that a too. Fucking long ass movie, dude. Yeah, and it was just you know I think it was they were all idiots who got lured into the situation had yeah. so many opportunities to get the fuck out of there. Didn't take it. As soon as you know, Ma and Pa Kettle fell off the cliff. I was, I'd be out. Yes, 
Yeah, I would have been out, and it looks like it was it, it wasn't very hard to escape without them knowing. So it's like it could have just left. But saying that you know the boyfriend got what he deserved, like no, I mean he was he an asshole at times. Yeah, so was she. Yeah. I was like, yeah, she. I mean, they were both kind of. It was a toxic relationship. I think that's what people is like. It's a toxic relationship. Like he's an asshole. He is stringing this along absolutely. So just breaking up with her and being done. Yes. It, it is weird to me that some people don't see that the bad guy of that movie are the cult that's sacrificing people. It's the cult, and it's it's not necessarily her, but she is she represents the type of people that watch this movie and are like, oh, yeah, the boyfriend fucking sucks. You you would be in the cult. I don't, I don't know why people don't understand that. If you side with the girl in the cult, you would be in the cult. You're supposed to side with the boyfriend and be like, wow, this is really not you're supposed to side with the boyfriend. But you're supposed to be like, wow, that really fucking sucks. That is awful. That was a very early episode of Filmgasm, Austin and I. That was like our first real disagreement because he loved it. Yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> I'd like to redo that one. I'd like, you know, it's been a long time since I watched that. I'd like to give that another shot. Uh, I'll probably come to the same conclusion, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I've, I've watched it twice uh, and same conclusion. Uh, I'm going to save a lot of um the the stuff Colton brought up about like you know obviously got you know people coming out about oh the guy got reserved essentially the the man hating that happens for a certain film on the bay on the bad schedule that will be just perfect to talk about that yeah <laughs> that yeah. Film goes hard on that too mm-hmm. if anybody's been listening to the show for a long time they know exactly what you're talking about yeah <laughs> i would actually argue that film goes harder on that than it's some other really Oh my God! Yeah, what movie? Yeah. We can't. We can't say spoilers. We'll yeah. tell you when we're when we're off the air. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so ultimately, Hellbound would gross twelve million on a budget of three million pounds, roughly three point four million US. Uh, has an IMDb score of six point four, Rotten Tomato score of fifty percent. Critics consensus reads: Hellbound Hellraiser two retains the twisted visual thrill of its predecessor although seams in the plot are already starting to show. And I got to say, I agree with them on that. Yeah. It feels like Hellraiser, but it it's missing something. I don't I don't agree at all. I don't they need to watch the other sequels. Then the seams start to show where it's like, "Oh boy, we're running on fumes here, aren't we, boys?" <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I also, yeah, I don't know what to say. say. Like, yeah. This they one, all get what I, it is. Like, well, I just disagree because I feel like this film does feel like a perfect continuation of the sequel that is giving you just more of the the backstory and more of that stuff while still knowing what it's what it wants to do. Whereas the yeah, the sequels, it's like, all right, let's go with this because sure. And well, on a personal note, I think what really bothers me, I don't like the subtitle before or the main title way of structuring a title. Oh my god. Hellbound, Hellraiser yeah. 2, Damien, Omen 2, The Lost World, Jurassic Park. I do not care for that. Brom, The Boy 2, one of the best sequels I've ever seen. I'm just oh. kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. That was sarcastic. Well, I thought it, that was why I reached my own computer right now. <laughs> I've not watched The Boy 2, but I did not like The Boy 1, so I will not watch The Boy 2. You didn't like the first one? God, no. Really? I thought it was okay. I, I liked Owen Cohan, and it. that's about it. Uh, that's all I got. I haven't seen The Boy or The Boy 2 because I heard they were shit. Uh, another one's Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, another film I don't ever intend to watch. It's oh just a God. weird way of structuring a sequel, and I don't know why they do it, and I don't like that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really bother me, but I, I, I mean, I get it. It just doesn't bother me as much. It doesn't, like, lower my score of the movie or anything. I just find it obnoxious. I, I feel what like if, like, it, they change the title completely, like Prometheus? I don't mind that as long as you know. I mean, I'll, I'll figure out it's connected as I go along. I'm, I'm okay with that. Like all the James Bond movies do that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I was like, if you can figure out Prometheus is connected, because you know Damon Lindelof doesn't like giving us conclusions. He likes answering. He likes asking questions, not answering them. When it comes to things that bother me about Prometheus, its connection to the Alien franchise is not at the top of the list. What is are the idiot scientists who are trying to pet the alien snake. 
Yes. <laughs> again, Lindelof's like, look, I'll, I'll pose questions. I will not answer a single one, nor try to connect this in any way, shape, or form to all hey, these. Man. All the scientists or science interested people I've met are fairly smart <laughs> and wouldn't do something that no, no. mind blowingly stupid. So I don't know. Anyway. Uh, and I just thought, you know, Hellraiser 2, it, it, I almost fell asleep a couple of times. Like there's some lulls in this. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't, with the first one, I feel like it's so tight and concise that like every moment is necessary. I feel like you could have shaved some time off Hellraiser 2. I don't think so. I yeah. think everything in Hellraiser too. I never tell if you're serious or you're just trying to eat my lunch. I don't know. <laughs> I can never tell. I really think this one's as tight as the first film. Okay. I highly disagree with y'all on all accounts. <laughs> Apparently you do. Um, it remains the most beloved sequel in the franchise, but that's really only because the rest of them are largely reviled. So, the best of the worst. <laughs> That was the best, the best. Okay. Uh, let's discuss some you don't like it. Doesn't mean you need to be rude to the fans that do. Okay. Thank That's you. Exactly what it means. No, I hope they burn you at the stake and then you go in your own little limit configuration. Hold okay. on, I got Jiffy Pop on the on the on the stove. You know, you can even... <sighs> okay. I do like that we start out with pinheads a little bit of pinheads origin here that he was just some soldier who found the box and turned yeah. into pinhead a little a little doug bradley without yeah. the makeup yes and apparently that gets built up on in hellraiser 3 because they intended to go full backstory on a lot of these guys in this one but they didn't have the budget or the time yeah i think the i think the studio was pretty restricted i think they had a really shitty studio they were working with that was like really restrictive New World Pictures, I believe, and they they restricted the budget at the last minute, which is always yeah, yeah. Kids. Which is yeah, New World Pictures is pretty notorious for shit like that. Um, at the time, so which could explain a lot of how this film turned out. It's probably why I do also like it because I know like I'm one of those. I'm like, well, all the all the constraints they had, the fact that they even pulled the damn thing off, and then in later films, they didn't have those constraints, and you're like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> but uh. It is interesting to kind of see Pinhead's humanity in this. And it's a weird decision because in these first two films, I don't really see the Cenobites as the bad guys. Well, that, there was no, oh, and that's, yeah. that, that's the thing, right? In the first two, Barker never intended these, any of these Cenobites to be the main bad guys. Obviously, you know, the fans got very attached to Pinhead and Cenobites to the extent, and they became the face of the franchise. And, you know, obviously fine and dandy, but it was never meant to be. And again, yeah. it's one of the things I kind of like about this sequel, too, is that, again, why it feels to me just like a perfect continuation of the first film is that it maintains that. You know, it's not, you know, you know, it took me a minute, you know, obviously what would happen to Penance and I'm like, oh, shit. But I'm like, well, wait, you take into account they're following the first film and the ethos of like, these aren't the main bad guys. These are just a part of the system. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, they're, they're, they're almost nothing. They're punishing sadistic masochists or sadomasochists. There you go. Who just open the box and, you know, want to play in hell. And these guys are like, hey, come on. You know, you want to go. Here's the door. <laughs> these first two films is they, they're just like the biggest king shame. I think anyone's ever done that. That that That's what these two movies are. It's just one big king shame. That's true. Because, you know, Barker. He's into some weird shit. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't he's think not. he's doing this type of stuff in private, but no, he's doing it in public. He he wrote this shit. <laughs> he's telling everybody, like, I would not say no. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> you ever hear heard him like in interviews and stuff? He's yeah, he's weird. <laughs> like the S and M Stephen King. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um <laughs> I, don't know, I think yeah. Stephen King is in some kinky shit too. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, he gets weirdly underage in too many of his stories. Uh, I'm not going down this rabbit hole anymore. <laughs> nope, that's for yeah. another. Oh boy. Um, uh, so yeah, first... I... oh, good. So I was going to say before we before we do that, I have to point this out, and I understand the the time frame when they were making these films. Not many people could exactly. At one point, there was no home video market. Then there was, but it was still very expensive. But God, man, the, it 
people talk about things on aging well, obviously, because of changing times and what's you know okay to say and what not okay to say, you know, all that stuff. Fine, whatever, right? But I think people need to talk about one that has an age role is watching old films that do a fucking recap <laughs> at oh. the beginning. Because yeah. again, I understand I understand at the time, like you waited two years, there was no home video market. Hey, let's quickly catch the audience up. It's been a while, right? They've only seen it the one time at the theater. Man, now when you have like the home video home videos thing, I have both the films on Blu-ray, both from Arrow. I can watch them back to back. I it's like the opening this and Friday thirteenth. I just watched those opening minutes, like, all right, I just watched it. Yeah. Let's get on with the movie. It felt so lazy and so unnecessary. Like I saw Hellraiser. I know what I'm getting into. <laughs> like, and it was a year gap. So I feel like it was still fairly fresh in the minds of the people who were going to go see this. Yeah. So we didn't we didn't need all of that. Like we didn't need the entire ending of the movie again. It it the 80s did it the most. The 80s were like the worst about fucking doing it. Previously on Hellraiser. Oh god. Okay. <laughs> Previously on Friday 13th, part three. Well, okay, if you're watching part four, I'm pretty sure you know what happened in the first three films. That's another thing. Like, I would, you know, trust your audience to have seen the first film. It's called Hellraiser 2. If you're in here and you don't know what Hellraiser is, you got to yell at your friend who brought you. It's, but that's not the movie's job. Anyway. Yeah, it's just a, one, a fun thing I to point out, you know. Again, you know, I know obviously different times, so there's a different mindset, but it's just funny now in the very prevalent streaming home video market that you're like, hey, let me, I just finished first one, let me watch the second one. And you're sitting there wondering, did I play the second one? Why am I watching the ending? Like, oh, they're recapping. <laughs> this isn't a TV show, right? It's it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to Hellraiser 2. Last episode. That's what it feels like. That's the vibe. Yeah. Um, waiting for like the opening credits theme song. Um, it's just because I watched House of the Dragon recently that I'm just like instead of it's like the Hellraiser credits, but it's just the House of the it's a fucking theme song for Game of Thrones. Dun, 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 dun. I was gonna say just... Indiana Jones would be pretty fucking funny for like a theme song for Hellraiser. <laughs> uh, I I would love if they just went like full SpongeBob. <laughs> oh, like no. or like Dragon hey. Tales or something. <laughs> Some kids shit. Oh no! It, but but it wouldn't be the uh, the actual opening title theme song for Spongebob, it would be the one that plays at the end credits. You know, the one's like, do 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 That would be that one. That would be fucking wonderful. <laughs> I think, you know what, I think considering how fucked up and weird these movies are, I don't think the tone would would be a problem. I think it would mesh. <laughs> yeah. It would, just, it would just freak you out more. You'd be like, this isn't, like, I'm uncomfortable now. <laughs> uh, so we meet Kirsty again. She's committed to a psychiatric hospital because no one believes a word she says about what happened at her at her family's house. The boyfriend is just like off screen, like, "Oh yeah, we sent him home. <laughs> we never see him again." I love when they can't get actors back, so they have to find a way to explain why they're not on screen. Yeah, they just make him look like the biggest asshole who just witnessed some horrific shit and then just left his girlfriend at the hospital. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that seems awful. Have fun. Yeah, basically, like this isn't my problem anymore. I get um, you out of the house, right? <laughs> and that cop is just like, "Tell me what happened," and she's like, "I did," and he's like, "Tell me the truth, damn it!" Like, good. You Where's good cop? The truth. Can't handle yeah. the truth for a cop. <laughs> good cop is the nurse who comes in. Then we got Doctor Shenard, who's just the creepiest British thespian. Who's clearly the bad guy? The second we see him, he's like, "No way is this guy on on her yeah. side." <laughs> yeah, opening his opening monologue, I was like, "Ah, oh, so villain." Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Oh yeah, good guys I don't mean, monologue. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do like how the the film does not hide it. They're like, "Look, this is our villain. This is our bad guy." In case you're, in case anyone's asking, and if you don't understand that he's the bad guy in this opening scene of him talking about a puzzle while he's operating on a brain. In the Hellraiser film. Come on, people. Um, we get the whole scene where they go to his office, and it is just nothing but how can I find this Lamech configuration? Here's, like, okay, yeah. Appreciate here's the guy. here's the opening speech by Dr. Shenard. This is what he says while he's doing an operate, he's operating on a brain. And this is before you know anything about him. If you like just cold open, never seen the movie, 
would you immediately know this is the bad guy if he says this? The mind is a labyrinth, ladies and gentlemen, a puzzle. And while the paths of the brain are plainly visible, its ways deceptively apparent, its destinations are unknown. Its secret's still secret. And if we are honest, it is the lure of the labyrinth that draws us to our chosen field to unlock those secrets. Others have been here before us and have left us signs, but we as explorers of the mind must devote our lives and energies to going further to tread the unknown corridors in order to find ultimately the final solution. We have to see, we have to know. Immediately. Yeah, that's so psycho shit talking. here from your doctor. Yeah. yeah, as he's operating on a patient's brain the whole time. Yeah, creepy. Um, and then we see him, you know, just go to the basement or the, the maintenance level where it's just a sea of seriously deranged people. He's locked away for his sick experiments, uh, including one guy who he just hands a straight razor and has the guy carve off his imaginary bugs. So that, uh, that's a real thing. And that's probably the most terrifying mental illness I can ever fucking think of. Oh, fuck that, man. Like, you know, oh. Bugs under your skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, that scene. Um, later on in the movie, when he gives him a straight razor, that was pretty fucking tough. Yeah, yeah. yeah I gotta tough. say, in, yeah. watching this again, I forgot how tough this scene is to watch. Like, there's just something about like the actor deliver- delivering it, and then like the close-ups of seeing the maggots and stuff. But obviously, that's what he sees. It's not what's on him. Yeah. And then the like the way he's just cutting himself. Like, it, to their credit, like you know, it it doesn't hold back. It it's like this scene's like, look, for those who. <laughs> In case you for some reason didn't know what movie you're watching, it's like this is a Hellraiser sequel. This is the type of shit you're getting, so buckle the fuck up. Like, we aren't fucking around here. Oh, fuck, <laughs> man. I thought this was Lego Movie 2. <laughs> fuck. What's this, 88? Like, oh shit, this isn't Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was about to watch Monster House. <laughs> Uh, you know, my dad being the huge Barker fan, he had the lament configuration, like a, a replica. I no. It, my mom gave it to him as an anniversary present or something. Like that's, yeah. that's awesome. I didn't oh, know what it was when I was a kid. I just thought it was like this cool looking box. <laughs> I would love to have like a replica of it. I would love that. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Uh so when the guy starts slicing himself up on the mattress, the blood. Allows Julia to come back and skinless Julia just jumps out of the mattress and starts like basically just sucking this guy's brains out. Dude, I in both in both the first two films, like the man, the gore and like practical effects they employ to like pull off some of this stuff is insanely good. Yeah. I will say that that was pretty good. I really like the makeup on the skinless um Frank and Julia. Yeah. That were really, really fucking good. And then just the way that she looked coming out of the mattress was pretty freaky. Yeah, the way it lingers on her just trying to grab the guy. Like, I don't know, there's not a lot of cuts there. It's just it's yeah. like her trying to grab the guy's legs and then climb on him. Yeah, the whole just... time he's like just begging to be helped. You're like, God, yeah, that's a fucking... Let's just say if you were a kid and you walked in... Because I know I don't know about you guys, but growing up, there was a lot of times my dad would watch something on TV and I just walked in. And it was always the weird scene. Like, I'll never forget, like, when you watch The Matrix on TV one day. I didn't come in during, like, the cool action. No, I came in during the part where the dude has, like, his, you know, kind of gets his mouth shut. And they put the fucking thing in him. Yeah. Like, the, the mirror effect. And as a kid, I went, what the fuck? And I left. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is that type of moment. Like, where, of course, you know, you can just imagine if you're, like, the kid walking in. You're like, ah! Oh! Dude, you know? when I was, like, six or seven years old. I saw that at a blockbuster. Like I was like at a blockbuster, we were renting a movie, me and my mom or something. And I was watching the TV and the matrix was on. Uh, and I saw that scene. I'd never seen the movie before. And I just saw that part and I had nightmares for a while. I was like, what was that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. My dad was trying to tell me, was like, it's really cool. I was like, that wasn't cool. And then I watched it. I was like, oh, this was a really cool movie. <laughs> Oh, um, and then Shenard is just over there kind of checking his watch, just waiting, like, could Julia hurry up here, please? Like, we got stuff to talk about. <laughs> we have an hour and a half movie. Come on. TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. We got run time to meet here. Come on. And Come then on. he keeps feeding her people. She comes back to full power. I guess she didn't need, I guess she just got her regular skin back. I guess Frank had to get well, his I mean, own skin, but. Yeah. I think, well, no, I think in the first one, if Frank had kept going, he would have gotten his skin back. I think he he chose to kill his brother because he's like, fuck it, I'm doing that. But I think it's implied that had he kept going, he would have gotten his skin back. Um, 
I do like in this film, they're like, look, we gave you a first film without like half the plot of the movie is Frank getting his skin back. So they're like, let's just quickly get through this part so we can get to the story of this film. It reminded me of The Mummy, you know, like in the first one, the whole movie is Imhotep getting, you know, sucking out like the people who took the jars. And then in the second one, that's like a five minute scene. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm like, I mean, if you're watching the sequel, do you want to watch that again? Like I saw in the first one, I get it. I know, like, I don't need to see it again. I like the quick montage, so I still get it and be like, hey, yeah, I don't want to watch a whole film of this again. So, going back, ooh, yeah, I was going to say, going back to the conversation we had about sequels, that's another thing I like when, um, like this movie, it was sort of like the big bad is Frank, but that's just like the first part of this whole thing. That's what I liked about the Stranger Things series is because season one, the big bad was just one Demogorgon. And then season two, it's a whole shit ton. And then it just keeps growing into like bigger people, which that's another thing I like about sequels or I think is important to sequels. You got to raise the stakes. You know, it can't be the same situation. Shit's got to be a little bit more dire. Mm -hmm. And when you don't, you know, when it's not just Frank, it's Julia and a weird doctor. Now shit's real. Yeah, you have you have Trula, who is out for revenge now. This doctor who is obsessed with this this ward, and it's like, yeah, it's a recipe for just bad things. Mm-hmm. And we get to see how Cenobites are made. We go to hell. Julia puts him in a box. He gets razor wired. Let simmer for twenty minutes. Come back, Cenobite. Yeah, that was that was like I said. I like that. I like that we saw that. I really do like how they kind of go into the sun bites. So I feel like this, you know, we, that's one thing with sequels that you always have to worry about, especially with horrors. Like, is you know, when is it too much explanation? And it takes the scare away. In this film, I think they did just enough where it doesn't take the scare away. Because at the end of the day, the first one establishes, or it's inferred, I won't say it's, but it's inferred that these were once people that got twisted into what you see on the screen because of what they've experienced in that ward. And this film just takes that what it's inferred and builds on it and says, well, this is what happened. This is how this thing happened. And it's just as horrific. You know, it's not like you're watching to me. I'm not watching going, well, this is kind of lame excuse. I'm sorry. going, no, that's pretty horrific. Don't fucking like that. Yeah. You can't spend all your time in nightclub. You need a day job, too. Otherwise, you will end up like this. Yes. That's the lesson I took away from this. (laughs) Uh and he's he's a creepy Cenobite. Why is I wonder why he is like so much more powerful than Pinhead and his gang. It had something to do with that thing that was attached to him. Yeah, what was that? Well, and also I think it was I think it's less powerful. I think it's just that he didn't want to work with them because you can tell the other guys they were like, yeah, we're cool, we'll hang out, we'll work together. They were work buddies, you know. The thing <laughs> that I were... said it was senpai. Oh God, <laughs> dear God. <laughs> Yeah, I think the thing on his head was Leviathan, but moving on. Yeah. Whereas this was one that was like, I don't want to work with you guys. Fuck you guys. This is my world now. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. he wanted that kind of control. Whereas I was so much like, let's just work together. We're here. Yeah. Fucked. Well, they went down like a bunch of bitches. Like, what was that? Just like, pew, yeah. And they're all gone. And that pissed me off. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I got them not got... being. I was like saying again, though, them not being like you know going with clive barker's original vision and them just being another part of this board doesn't really bother me well true but the film the first film establishes that they're you know powerful enough to like warp reality and then in the second one they can't stop a mad doctor like, yeah, the they can't they stop do. a mad doctor and the thing that like turned them off was Bellamy. remember who you are it gave me vibes from like the batman versus superman when he's like what what did you just say that's my mom's name too that's what that warp, reminds me of. They don't really warp reality. They only I remember the only time reality gets warped is when the box gets open. The box was open. They were in hell. Like yeah, they were in their world. This was their domain. Why can't they do anything about it? Because it's also his domain now, since he is a Cenobite. I, no, I'm not. No, I'm not buying it. I want more. Look, just because you put way more, inf- you know, of them on a godlike pedestal. And don't want to be listening to Parker's original vision. That's your problem, sir. The original That's vision the means dick. The movie is what we got. <laughs> nope. Parker's vision no. means everything. Because he is the, the one and only creator. What, the what is on screen in Hellraiser 
from start to finish is all the canon that matters. Nope. So That's anything that that makes that look bad, I find you obnoxious. sound like you sound like a crazy man. Okay, so yeah. Game of Thrones season eight was fantastic because the original vision exactly is better than what was on screen. Yeah, exactly. I'll double down. Connor, he just you know. checkmated your ass is what he did. I don't care. <laughs> season eight was a great season of Game of Thrones. You know what? Oh, um, you can always tell when you've won when he doubles down. <laughs> season eight was the best damn season <laughs> ever. I can't wait to watch it again. It's nice, the, it's nice doing this with backup for once. Especially the long night, because I like not being able to see the TV. <laughs> there it is. Anyway, I feel like your main bad guy getting, you know, like, blurred by the power of friendship and then getting nailed to a fucking wall hurts your franchise a little bit. I don't think it hurts it at all. I think he what if Jason fine? was, like, thrown, like, a little, you know, <laughs> drawing of him and Mommy, and he had a moment of, like, Mama? And then they cut his head off. They've done that quite a bit. They've, yeah, they've it was always stupid. It. No, it wasn't. It made sense because he's a mama's boy. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh. <laughs> anyway, who, sh- who should come back into frame but good old Uncle Frank? Everyone's favorite probable child molester uncle. In the sex room, as I call it. Yeah, in the sex room where he was. Yeah, he was he was ready to fuck his niece. And I guess she figured out how to burn the place down. There's so much. I want to point out that I watched this before I watched the episode of House of Dragons. And I was like, oh, boy, there was a theme this weekend. I still haven't watched that. There's a theme this weekend. Fire, I assume. That's incense. My favorite. No. Is lavender. Sorry, that was a dumb joke. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Uh, They only have one. One smell of incense in hell, and it's patchouli. Anyway, um, I forgot my point. <laughs> Sorry, it was a joke about incest that I think threw it off. I got you there. Well, I guess Frank is still, you know, fire still hurts Frank. So he just starts ripping his skin off because that's what you do when you get set on fire. And Julia shows up like, hey, remember me, lover? And rips his heart out. And that's the last we see of Frank. I do like how he he really... One, I like how he's not dubbed in this one like he was in the first one. <laughs> Two, Wait, I like what? how he, he... Yeah, you didn't know that in the first one? Like, he, they dubbed him for some weird reason, though he's American. I, I don't know why. Was it Andrew Robinson's voice? I... No, I like, know. Frank was just dubbed. That's weird. Not in the first, not in the sequel though. Um, two, I, I just like the idea that he for a second was so cocky and be like, "Come on, babe, let's work together." I'm like, "You, you killed her, dude. Yeah. You think she wants to work with you again?" <laughs> he's Frank. He's you know he's got the magic touch. On that moment, Julia was oh, a woman scorn. That's yeah. a scary villain name, Frank. Oof. Yeah, yeah, you know there is something to that. I don't like the name, especially when you throw Uncle in front of it. Oh no, not Uncle Frank! No. <laughs> Sorry to anybody out there who has a decent Uncle Frank, but I highly doubt. It. Um, yeah. So Julia pursues Kirsty, and by the way, there's this girl Tiffany who loves puzzles that's just kind of walking around the whole time. Uh, we never really find out her deal. Uh. That's there's more, you know, disappointment. No, it's perfectly put in the story. She likes puzzles. She is the one I think being operated on at the beginning with fucking brains. So the doctor has a special interest in her because she knows about puzzles. He's hoping to use her to open the layman configuration and figure it out. The doctor killed her mom. Probably. Why? No, probably doesn't cut it. <laughs> Let's cut it. <laughs> it's called inferring in the story. I need you to do look beyond the surface level, Connor. Okay, do some critical thinking while you're watching. I have, believe me, Mr. I've tried. I like o- Mr. I like Oscar films. I do. Because most of the time, I know what the fuck's going on. We also have to do critical thinking on those because they are they have you know their head up their asses half the time. You know what? You know, if you like reading between lines, you should go see Crimes Against Humanity. Tell us what you thought. 
Crimes? You mean crimes of the future? Oh uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, same thing. Crimes against humanity. A, that's that's a, that's a that's an offense to send you to jail. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you had you had a valid point there, man, and it just fizzled. <laughs> Yeah, go go watch Crimes of the Future. Yeah, sometimes you gotta read between the lines on films. It's between probably... these lines. Anyway, <laughs> this because <laughs> you guys can't do it in this one. It's fine. Go on, Connor. The Cenobites show up and they're like, "Hey, remember us? You got a debt to be paid." And Kirsty's like, "You were people too." And they have a moment of like, "Oh, we were." And they stand in front of <laughs> Dr. Chenard and, and the two girls. And I, I, do, I did think that was a neat moment if they'd actually done something. It's still a neat moment. Then Pinhead becomes, you know, just Doug Bradley. And he has that, like, that nod moment to Kirsty, which, again, amounts to fuck all. No, he's telling her, like, it's his way of saying, like, he, he's, he wants to die. It's inferred that they don't want what they're experiencing. Like, deep down, they hate their fucking lives. So I think they took it as like, look, this is a chance to just finally be dead and not be in this stupid ward anymore. Okay. And just read between the lines. Imagine if Harry Potter went up to Voldemort and was like, remember, your name is Tom Riddle. And he was like, you know what? You're right. I'm pretty sure he calls him Tom Riddle a couple of times in the movies. He does. does. I'm pretty sure he does exactly that a couple of times in the the movies. But imagine if it just like erased his entire plan of like, you know what? Things are going to be fine. I don't need to be evil and powerful. Again, they're, big, you know. they're twisted into that. I don't think anyone actually likes their shit there. So I think it was less of a thing in them kind of going like, this is our ticket out. We can be done with this fucking place. Well, they they weren't. There's like a lot more movies. <laughs> Apparently, like, how do you fucking die in this world? Yeah, but again, they did this about... I think the knowledge that they were going to have as many sequels, as many straights of video sequels for sure as they did. They end the movie with a big pole with P- Pinhead's face and the guy selling the box. So like clearly they wanted to remind you, they hey, he's not really a, dead. They wanted a third movie. Uh, Kirsty just wore Julia's skin to distract Shenard. I thought that was funny. Again, she's bleeding from the forehead and nobody notices <laughs> It's like the the telltale sign of I'm wearing someone else's skin. I'm going to like accidentally just like cut myself and I shave my head so then to see if you notice. Well, if you combine that with a weird look in your eye and a different voice, I'm I'm going to notice. <laughs> I don't think you will. <laughs> and if you had died like five seconds ago. That too. Dead give died, away. But <laughs> if, if your skin shed off your body five seconds well, ago. You're in hell. I'm not going to trust some like watching Julia die and then like she's right there i'm gonna be like well this is hell i don't yeah think... okay that, that that is fair, that I, is fair. I don't think stranger if things was there here. Yeah. how the know. hell did shenard die something just ripped his head in half and then that was it like what what happened there the thing got pissed at him because his plane got foiled it, it hadn't got foiled yet like nothing had happened like the girl hadn't even finished with the box yet yeah they killed him remember what was his plan? To just take over that whole dimension. He wanted to be the god of hell. Yeah. Why would the why would the Leviathan be okay with that? Probably because it's thirsty for power as well. Making a lot of inferences there. But yeah. there could be one. It's so called, the doctor's it's gonna have called to actually, you know, inferring from what the movie gives you. You know what it's I could have used? That thing wants someone powerful. I could have used a lot less doctor puns. The doctor <laughs> yeah. is in. I need. I, I, I want more sorry. doctor puns. <laughs> Give me all of the doctor puns. You're like you're the guy on the debate team who wins by going, "Yeah, well, fuck you." <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we end with a totem pole. <laughs> Tiffany and Kirsty just kind of walk off into the sunset, and something shoots out of the mattress and kills one of the movers. Because right, no one t- takes care of the mattress. I love how Kirsty, who's been like, you need to take care of the mattress. At the end of the film, gets out of hell. Quite the experience, if you ask me. And then doesn't take the time to go burn the mattress. Turns out if you die in hell, you can just come back whenever you want. Actually, like, no one stays dead. 
I was like, don't even, don't even throw that at this movie because we both watched Supernatural. I'm not talking about Supernatural. I'm talking about this. I'm no. I'm just saying we watched a show where for 15 seasons they just came and went into hell as they please. It does not bother me in Hellraiser two. It bothers me in Hellraiser two because they try to make death have so much you know stakes. Like they keep acting like, oh, we got him, we did it every time, and no, they didn't fucking all, do it. All horror movies do that, and they leave the tease for the sequel. But this one especially, uh, it just, nope. it's so big every time. And it, I just, I don't know. I don't, I fail to see the difference when every horror franchise has done that. I know you got them, and then the we want to tease the sequel. Was, um, was Julia evil because she got resurrected, or was she, I know she was evil before then. Oh, she, she, was, be... she was a cunt from day one. Okay, cool. So, like, Jeez, being resurrected like ever. that doesn't turn you evil. Well, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't help, but no, she was just a bad person from, from the get go, and then. Then she got a taste of like hell power, and now she's like, "I'm gonna be queen of this place." And Doctor Shenard's like, "Fuck that!" And mm. yeah, there you go. Hellraiser two. <laughs> so. No, Hellbound. Hellraiser two. This is the last time I'm gonna watch this movie. It's gonna be. This is a wonderful film. Just because you're wrong. Here are some film guys and facts for Hellbound Hellraiser two. This first one I thought was really interesting and kind of odd. This film, along with Titanic, holds the record for the most times two characters repeat each other's names. Okay. Tiffany and Kirsty. It's this and it's Titanic. Ah, okay. Yeah, Rose and Jack. Interesting record to have. Oh, yeah. I wonder who made that connection. Because somebody had to tally that shit, and that person needs a friend. That that makes me wonder. So w- they have to like make a record of everything in every film ever. Yeah, basically. it's unlike a movie now where there it's two characters like Dumb and Dumber, but after every word that they say, they say the other character's name just to break that record. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. I think the most fucks is Wolf of Wall Street. I think that broke the record. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I yeah, want to be the guy that actually has to count the amount of times of like fuck is said in a movie. I would just highlight it in the script. That'd probably be easier. Uh, I think Goodfellas had the record before, so Scorsese like broke his own record. It's just great. Oh, that's the record that's worth beating. <laughs> yeah. Um, number two, Kenneth Cranham, who plays Shenard, claimed his involvement was due to his grandson pestering him to take up the offer because he was a fan of the first movie. Now, he was a pretty old fellow in the 80s, so I'm assuming he had an adult grandson. <laughs> Otherwise, there's some bad parenting going on in the Cranham house. Yeah. <laughs> All good parenting. Why not let your child watch this at five and be very confused about sexuality and violence? <laughs> it's a weird thing to like, hey, grandpa, you got to do this. This is such a great movie. I'm picturing the situation with the... Richard Harris playing Dumbledore. It's like, please, please play Dumbledore, but please, please pay pin. Uh, please pay a crazy doctor. Please, God, I want you to be in this film, Grandpappy. Please, please play. Please stab Pinhead and get your head ripped in half, Dad. Granddaddy. Please, <laughs> please. It's all I've ever wanted. I really like the first one. I want to see you in the sequel. Die horrendously. Do you think that while Cranham was reading the script and he saw that he had to hit some like weird? like tube shit shoved in his mouth when he was in the, the big box. He was like, oh, dear Lord, no, this is beneath me. And then his grandson walked in, Hellraiser 2? They're doing Hellraiser 2? You could do Hellraiser 2? Oh, my God, you got to do it, Grandpa. You got to do it. <laughs> he was this close to saying, it, like, to telling his agent to, to piss off. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Um, and number three. Julia, played by Claire Higgins, was originally supposed to rise from the mattress as the Queen of Hell at the end of the movie, and she was going to be the series' continuing villain. Like, she was supposed to be the bad guy of the Hellraiser franchise. However... Hmm? Oh, nothing. I don't want Caleb to hear what I said. No, what what would you say? I said that would have been better. Ooh! I'm fine with her. I'm, that doesn't make me mad. I actually really like her as a villain. Again... Oh. Swing Barker never really wanted Pinhead to be the face of this franchise like he became. I'm cool with that. Well, Hellraiser came out. Everyone liked Pinhead. So, 
he became the bad guy of the franchise. Yeah. Well, and also, I don't think she was interested in Beyond 2. I think that was another thing. Like, she came back to do 2, and then they, I think they like they were like, hey, you want to do a third one? She's like, no. You know what I found out? Claire Higgins is in Ready Player One. No, she's not. You remember at the beginning of the movie where Wade is, like, walking through the, the stacks, and he meets that one lady who's like, how you doing, Wade? What's wrong? Life getting you down? Oh, shit. That's her. <laughs> huh. That's crazy. Yeah. Small world. Uh, well, that's all I've got for Hellbound. I give it a seven, which I think is generous. I think it's more convoluted and more dull than the first film, but it does have some memorable moments. I think you're incredibly wrong, and you guys clearly just don't get this sequel. Uh, it's very evident that it's an eight and an outstanding sequel to the original film that just builds on everything they established. And I absolutely agree. It's one of the best horror sequels of all time. Hold on. Hold on. So you mad at him for giving it a seven because he says, yeah, it's still good, but it's not great. And then you're like, no, this is one of the best sequels ever made. And they're like, no, but it's an eight, but it's an eight. I was going to give it an eight. I was thinking <laughs> I was exactly gonna... the same thing, Colton. You beat me. Brother. I was going to give it an eight. No, it's because he had to include the word, and that's being generous. So what do you actually feel, Connor? If I all right, if I wasn't feeling generous, if I was if I watched this on a bad day, probably a six. See, you know what? I've right. had a pretty good day, so fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Colton, no. what's your score? I I I I give it an eight, which I don't fucking understand why Caleb is so mad. <laughs> Because I think it's 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 an eight, but I don't give it an eight as a horror movie. I give it an eight as a fun, goofy movie to watch. No, okay. because the doctor is in had me dying. Yeah. It is funny, Caleb, that you went so hard on like this is the, one of the greatest sequels of all time, and there, and then you gave a score of good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, if this is if that's your bar for like good, a ten has got to be like. Give, given to you by Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> like, just the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Completely rewrites everything you know about life itself. <laughs> I mean, Hellraiser has never been one of my all-time favorite franchises, so. <clears throat> oh, this is this is fun. Uh, well, thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, feel free to follow us on our socials, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Filmgasm Productions. You can send us a message there if you've got a film you'd like us to, to talk about, or you can email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. Uh, check out the website, filmgasm.com. We've got reviews, articles, trailers of upcoming films, and all of our shows. If you want to support the show on Anchor, you can click on support this podcast on your preferred provider. Thank you for listening. Uh, next week sees the release of a horror staple for the third time in its long life. The Halloween franchise is ending. Never to darken our theaters again. Sad. I give it five years. I give it two. <laughs> oh, my I mean, if the rumors are true, right, and we are getting a Friday Thirteen next year, and that's like big, big money. Oh man, they'll be crazy. Be like, hey, hey, we gotta get, we gotta get Michael out there. Get Michael back out there. If Buster Rhymes can't kill it, if Rob Zombie can't kill it, I highly doubt an actual showdown is gonna do anything. <laughs> So bring it on. Uh, with the release of Halloween Ends, we're continuing our yearly project into the franchise with the most divisive entry, 1982's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, the only film in the franchise to have absolutely nothing to do with Michael Myers. Instead, the Silver Shamrock Mask Company uses ancient magic to create deadly Halloween masks for children that will kill them on Halloween night, and only Tom Atkins can stop them. Next week is sure to be divisive here as well, as Caleb really likes this entry, and uh, big surprise, I don't. Because you're wrong again, it's fine. Oh, that, that, oh, boy. Yeah. Halloween 3, I've been dreading this one because I know that this is going to be basically like, you know, debating a brick wall, but we'll see. Season of the Witch is an amazing film, and you just need to get on board, sir. No, I will not. I will not get on board with this weird-ass movie that has this love I don't understand. Because... So, uh, Maybe I'll it get it this time, but I doubt it. Because it deserves the love. It's received. Look at my amazing 4K of it. Look at that. 
yeah, that's that's a movie you bought, all right. Yeah, I'm <laughs> glad. Oh, God, what a wonderful film. Yeah, okay. We'll find out next week. Don't miss 2017's The Bye Bye Man on Friday's Beyond the Bad and the 2010 boxing biopic The Fighter on Oscar Sunday. Until then, don't solve any weird-looking puzzle boxes. And if you're into pain-pleasure scenarios, right on. Give me a call. See you next week. Keep watching movies. (laughs) 